Hi, Martin. Hello, Hanand. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure for me too. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Ah, you're welcome. Uh, so today my guest is Martine Labbé. She's honorary professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Her main research area is discrete optimization, including graph theory and integer programming problems with a particular emphasis on location and network design problems. She's also specialized in bi-level optimization and studies pricing problems and Stackelberg games. She serves or has served on the editorial boards of important journals and was the editor-in-chief of the Euro Journal on Computational Optimization from 2012 to 2020. She's the author or co-author of more than 140 papers published in international journals. In 2007 and 2008, she was president of Euro in 2014 and 2015, she was vice chair of the SIAM Activity Group on Optimization. In 2019, she was awarded the Euro Gold Medal. Martin, merci beaucoup for accepting the invitation. Thank you so much. Uh, how are you? Thank you. Muito obrigada. Uh, Thank you very good. much. <laughs> uh, Un grande prazer de falar contigo. Ah, uh, you, you just made my day with this very nice Portuguese word. <laughs> so, so you were born in 1958 in Brussels. Uh, tell me about your early years and your family. Okay, so I was born in Brussels. I grew up there uh, in a family of... Uh, we, I had two other sisters, two elder ones. I'm the youngest one. Uh, my father was a psychiatrist, medical doctor, uh, psychiatrist, and my mother was a housewife. Um, we lived in a very nice green area south of Brussels, and uh, I remember that the house was uh, in a dead end street. At the end, there was a tennis club, so. Uh, it was a very quiet and very safe environment. We used to play on the street uh, with the friends from the same street and, and to play tennis a lot, of course. So that was uh, great fun. Uh -huh. and, and which path your sisters took in their careers? Well, as I said, I have two elder sisters. The, 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 the older one um, is a classical singer and composer. Uh, she sings opera. And wow. uh, the middle one uh, is a psychiatrist also. She followed uh, daddy's path. Ah. So, and I'm very proud of both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, great sisters. Uh, they, the, you, did your father and sister uh, become psychoanalysts? Yes, ah. and they were, um, my, my father was because he passed away and my ah. sister is still uh, Freudian, as <laughs> one thing, I guess, while they are adepts of uh, Sigmund Freud. Uh -huh. and, uh, this is the, the vision of psychiatry. I was going to ask exactly that, if they prefer Freud or Jung. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so a musician, a mathematician, two psychoanalysts, not bad. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange, uh, very different path. And my, my, my psychiatrist uh, sister says that I'm the, um, the Cartesian one, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the mathematician, so everything should be black. Or white for me, uh -huh. and uh, gray is not really something <laughs> to be considered. <laughs> yeah, so you should like uh, mathematical formulations with binary variables. <laughs> for instance. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you mentioned that you play tennis, and uh, what are your main interests uh, other than that in those days? When I was a kid, I, I liked very much comic strips mm -hmm. also, comic books. Uh, me too. Uh, <laughs> is a famous uh, type of comic strip that I was reading and rereading all the time. So this was something I really enjoyed when I was, was a kid. This was uh, very 
very nice books I liked very much when I was a kid. Yeah, they made a cartoon uh, out of uh, yes. uh, the Tintin they Adventures. They made many, many cartoons. Yeah, indeed. so we got it here in Brazil, so that's why we are familiar with that too. Um, and how did your interest in math begin? Oh, I always, when, when I was a kid, I always liked puzzles, you know, mm. uh, quiz or things like that. And, um, and when I was at high school, I remember I started at the, when I was maybe 12, 13 years old, I was uh, already interested by solving equation. The, the first degree equation for me was something very interesting. And, uh, I like that very much. And then in the third year of high school, I think I had a fantastic teacher. Um, it was fantastic for me, but not for the rest of the, <laughs> the, the kids, I think, because she was very formal. And, and I learned a bit of group theory at that time and, and all those very conceptual and abstract things. And I found it was fascinating for me. I started to learn how to make proofs of, of results, how to be rigorous. And I found this was very interesting. I liked it very much. Mm. Is it true that you skipped the last year of school because except for math, you could not tolerate any of the other subjects? <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, I didn't like anything else. That's true. Uh, even other sciences. Uh, so I, I skipped the last year. I passed a, a special exam that, in fact, this exam was to um, to enter into the engineering school. And so it was mainly mathematics and a little bit of history and other things, but uh, mainly mathematics. And uh, that, that was the, the key to enter into the university. Mm. So, in fact, also I skipped all the, sub the scientific subject that you see in the last year of high school, like biology, you know, about the cell and all those things. And I'm totally ignorant about those things. That's very interesting because after that, when I started my, my, my research career, uh, later on, I, for instance, I got interested in, in solving some phylogenetic uh, tree problems mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, I was totally ignorant, so I had to learn all those things. And I found them very interesting. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, with proper motivation, maybe you, you really have the interest. Exactly. Yeah. Do you think that the lack of interest in the other subjects was uh, for any particular reason, the, the way it was thought, or now looking back, it was maybe your nature or you didn't have much interest as you were a restless kid? I think it was both. Lack of, of good, of uh, really motivating teachers and uh, and also uh, my 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 personality was like that i was very much focused on things i like to do mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so then you neglect the things that you you thought it was not really worth it exactly mm -hmm. um, growing up in a, in a family that has distinct personalities uh, did that made a difference on you? Uh, I think discussion is something that probably uh, have been extremely valued in your family. Yes, indeed. Um, we discussed this. In fact, my, my father was um, quite a peculiar person, if I can say. Um, he was a total adept of, I would say, um, what we call in French libre examen. I think in English one could translate it as free thinking, not to be influenced by any dogma or whatever you are allowed to, to also reconsider and question yourself about your decision and being uh, able to, to consider that in fact you were wrong and then you, sh you should change your mind. And the discussion around, uh, for instance, I remember lunchtime or dinner time was uh, fantastic and extremely important. That was really part of the family life. Excellent. Yeah. So that shaped you in a way. I think so. 
it, it was very very special in uh, we had absolutely no uh, no influence uh, for instance also regarding religion uh, for instance uh, we my father was uh, not not baptized not catholic had no religion my my mother was catholic she she decided to become catholic when she was 18 years old uh, they got married they did not baptize they they three daughters and for instance my elder daughter became catholic uh, later in her life and and me and the other sister we we didn't choose it, it's really a, a form of um, freedom of of deciding what you want to think and what you what you want yeah so it was literally a relaxed environment in terms of uh, constraints <laughs> in, yeah and in the, and also in the how you grew up and live with them that's very nice um were you a top student when you joined university no <laughs> well I, i've also maybe a particularity of of my family i thought about that uh, recently is that we were definitely not trained for competition. Uh, competition was not something that was around the table, if I can say. Uh, I have, n have not been raised in this, with this, this idea, and I don't know whether it's the reason, but I was a good student, but not a top one, and I enjoyed very much life, especially when I was at high school and at university. I like to go out with my friends to have fun, but I was succeeding in my studies, but, but not, I was definitely not among the top students. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're mentioning that uh, you're going out with friends and independence is something that you also really valued quite a lot, right? Yes, this is extremely important, uh, an extremely important concept in my life. Uh, I always thought that I wanted to become, uh, to be independent in my life and to um, to manage my own life myself, to take my decision, to be financially independent, of course, uh, but also to to, to organize um, my life in in the way I, I want. I'm, I'm of course uh, not living alone. I'm I'm married. Uh, I have a son, but but th this is part of my environment. And of course, we build life all together. But for me to be in independent, to be able not to depend on somebody is very important. Mm. Nice. Um, any contact with R during the undergrad? No, not at all. I studied, so the, the undergrad in, in, in Belgium was called the licence in mathematics. It was a four years uh, degree and uh, I stud studied pure mathematics. But at the end, I had a master, well, licence, a thesis to write for this licence and it was about discrete uh, geometry and I already like combinatorial aspects of mathematics. I was attracted very much by this kind of things, but no OR contact at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what was your first job? I mean, did you go straight to master's or you uh, found a job in between? What did you do? Well, after this degree of, of mathematics, the, the usual path uh, would have been for me to, uh, the normal path would have been for me to become a high school teacher. Mm. Uh, that was the destiny. <laughs> <laughs> but I was really not attracted by that. And there was an, another possibility uh, that was uh, to do a, a special degree on uh, actuarial sciences, or you can call it insurance mathematics. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a, a three years degree, but uh, it, the load, the work, the uh, working load was not very high, so you could uh, work at the same time. So during the last two years, uh, I was working in an insurance company um, as an actuarian. So I was uh, working there and uh, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> well, at that time, I think 
insurance company was something very much different than it could be today. The link with finance was very tiny. It was more about uh, doing some competition uh, for life insurance or doing budgets for the company. Well, I didn't like it at all because I found it was very basic and I was frustrated. Mm. Um, but I, I was fortunate because this is during this, this degree that I had uh, one course in uh, operations research and one course on game theory. And I love both subjects, so right. this motivated me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm starting to think that you're a, a person that is really hard to please. But fortunately, you found uh, some, some nice uh, subjects that you got really interested in. Uh, so what did you do in, in, in your master's finally? So in 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 this this was this master in actuarial sciences and i had a master thesis uh, to write so uh, uh, i did it on some game theory problem uh, i don't remember exactly the details i think it was about the core of a game uh, i don't remember exactly but i liked it very much and uh, i liked very much the the professor who was giving both courses Mm. Uh, actually, she became my uh, PhD advisor. Ah. Do you think that this early work uh, on game theory had uh, anything to do with your later interest in bi-level optimization? Might be. Uh, it, it's strange. Uh, it, it's indeed some kind of uh, something that follows me or something that I follow along the years. Uh, I did it already in the master thesis indeed. Then during my PhD, I worked on location problems, uh -huh. uh, but with competitive aspects, so with game theory aspects involved as well. Mm. And then for a while, I didn't consider those things anymore, but I went back to them with bi-level optimization. And at that time, I said, oh, interesting. This reminds me the old good days. <laughs> yeah, déjà vu. <laughs> exactly, déjà vu. Uh -huh. And... Uh... What actually made you be completely sure that you wanted to do a PhD? Was it okay? I don't, I don't like to go and work in the insurance company anymore. Or what actually made you uh, uh, realize that okay, I should go on and keep on studying? I loved doing the, the master thesis I did in mathematics, and then the master thesis I uh, I did for this actuarial science degree. I love doing research. There was a part of of doing a bit of research, and it was both of them were completely theoretical work. Uh, but I love both, and uh, I, I found operational research was a very attractive topic as well. Uh, so. I, all of these motivates me to, to go for a PhD. I thought, hey, this is fantastic. This is what I want to do. I mean, uh, research is, is fascinating. Uh, I love that. And uh, so I went on for, for the PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, but but for, for my PhD was, um, was not computational at all. Mm -hmm. So no coding. <laughs> No coding, nothing. Actually, uh, I developed polynomial algorithms mainly for mm -hmm. for some problems mm -hmm. that were, of course, polynomial because <laughs> this is a polynomial. But um, it, it it was uh, completely uh, on paper, <laughs> if I can say. Mm -hmm. No coding, nothing. And, uh, and actually, uh, I think in my life, I did one algorithm. I coded one algorithm like that. That's it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, that was also with cards. Uh -huh. You remember those? Yeah, those punch cards. cards. Yeah, I, I, I was, I, I don't remember cards. them, but I, I know I'm really aware of them. <laughs> yeah, it was a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you met a very special person uh in your phd right uh that helped you finding a research topic because uh, or was not really popular in, in brussels at that time correct indeed in in brussels 
Well, there was a group working on multi-criteria decision making, but this is something different. I, I was I was interested in uh, in more the optimization side of, of OR, and uh, so uh, indeed uh, it's uh, Pierre Hansen. Uh, who is now a professor in Montreal, but at that time he was professor in Lille. And um, there was also, there was actually two professors. There was Pierre Hansen and another one, a professor in economics uh, uh, in, uh, at CORE in Louvain-la-Neuve, uh, whose name is Jacques Tis. And I worked with both of them uh, for my PhD. But I was uh, working a lot with, with Pierre because he, he was really the OR person. Uh, Jacques was the economist more involved in, in the game theory aspects and so on. And um, I learned everything uh, from Pierre, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started my PhD, I had only one course in operation research. So I knew the basics of linear programming, a little bit of, uh, of graph theory, and, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> very ignorant uh -huh. and so I learned everything while doing my research for, for the PhD yeah. and working with uh -huh. Pierre. Uh, you told he was in Lille but how did you meet him? Uh, when actually Pierre did uh, his PhD in, in Brussels and uh, so he still had some uh, uh, some persons he was visiting in Brussels from time to time and, and there was a workshop also organized I think and uh, he came there for that workshop. So I approached him, uh, I took the opportunity that this workshop was at, uh, in my university. I went to, to talk to him and uh, I approached him that nice. way. Nice. If it was not for him, which path do you think you would have taken in OR? <sighs> I don't know. I don't know because at that time I was really uh, looking for, for a PhD subject. It was a, a strange situation somehow. I was a PhD student, but uh, I didn't really have a, a, a PhD subject. You know, this is the, 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 at that time uh, in the in the the eighties. Um, there were, especially in Europe, I think, places where you could be a PhD student, but you had to find your your subject by yourself. So struggle and, and be, <laughs> be lucky and, and start working on the subject. And so um, I, I remember at that time, just before meeting Pierre, I had uh, read the book on, uh, on random graphs and I found it very interesting and different things, but I had no, I, I'm pretty sure I would have uh, continued in, in this area of networks, graph, operation research, optimization, but I cannot tell you why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, yeah. I would not pick up, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and how hard was for you to learn about computational complexity? Because you were not training that. Okay. Uh, this was uh, also an interesting uh, story with Pierre. As I said, I was uh, very ignorant, very naive. so. The only thing I knew was the basics of, of OR. And we, when we, we started working together, um, I remember we were spending uh, afternoon, uh, one full afternoon, for instance, uh, in, uh, in the office where I was in Brussels. Uh, Pierre was, he was living in Brussels, so he was visiting, uh, for instance, the, the, my, he was visiting me for the afternoon. And we had this brainstorming uh, session in front of the blackboard. And, and Pierre was telling me a lot of things uh, like, oh, and this problem is uh, uh, you, you need to sort the n elements so it's order of n log n. And then, uh, and then you should, for, for finding this thing, uh, you can use a binary tree. Or I was totally, I could, I was totally ignorant. I couldn't understand anything. So I was taking notes and notes and notes. And same about, uh, this is about uh, complexity, so this is an NP-hard problem. I never heard about what was NP, what is an NP-hard, what is an NP-complete problem. So when Pierre was uh, gone, uh, I was uh, going to, uh, to the library, taking some books and starting to read and, and, 
and trying to understand the notes I had taken during his stay. It uh -huh. was uh, the way I learned. <laughs> Should have been really hard uh, to, to learn about the NP hard problems. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, it's true. It was hard, but it was fun as well, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, I've always been somebody who likes to learn things in the books. Mm -hmm. I didn't like very much to go to the class and attend mm -hmm. lectures. I was more take the book and start studying and understand. So yeah, as you said, you're very independent. So I think that made you probably more comfortable uh, with the process. Uh, did you struggle to write your first journal paper? <laughs> um, the first paper, uh, my the first paper coming from my PhD uh, was uh, a paper with Pierre Hansen, and uh, so he asked me to write the draft. I did that, and so I showed him. And uh, well, of course, this was uh, that time. It was in the eighties, so it was a handwritten draft, so, uh -huh. you know, yeah. on paper. Yeah. <laughs> and, Literally uh, a manuscript, right? Exactly, a manuscript, and so uh, he looked at it and said, okay, no, this is not good. And so he said, okay, let's sit down. Uh, so we sat down in, in, in my office and he started to dictate me <laughs> major part of, of, of the paper, at least, I mean, the things that needed to be said in a... <laughs> in an understandable way and in an academic mm. way. But I learned. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so were you able to get good publications from your PhD? Uh, I, I got several papers. I don't remember the count. Uh, uh, I think four, three, four. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Uh, four, or oh, yes, maybe more. And um, it took time, of course, to have all those papers published because also, again, at that time, you could not submit your paper through a website. You had to mm. make Xerox copy of the paper, submit it to the journal, well, put it in an envelope, send by post, uh, wait, uh, uh, wait for months to get the referee reports. And if you were lucky, if the things were not lost in somewhere in the, the, po in the mail, and uh, so it took a while to have all those papers published. But okay. uh -huh. Yeah, did you write your PhD thesis uh, by hand using a typewriter? Yes, I did. I, I, I wrote it by hand and then it had been uh, typewritten by secretary of the department uh -huh. um, on the an IBM machine, I remember. And these were fantastic electric typewriters with with balls. Ah. This was like, uh, and, and there were all the different characters on, on the ball, and then she had to change a different ball to, uh, to get access to the different characters. It was uh, uh -huh. awful. Uh -huh. uh, also, that means that when you, you were making things on the revision of a paper, uh, so she had to retype the, <laughs> the paper for uh, for su resubmission, mm -hmm. and uh, you could not have three or four different versions in each time. Come to it, and like, oh, I changed this, you know. Uh -huh. Could you change my draft? No, once she was starting typing, this had to be the ready, the version ready to be sent to, to, to the journal. Uh -huh. I mean, these people could not, <laughs> it's not like when you do cut and paste on your computer that mm. was a uh, real cut and paste at that time and it was very complicated for her to do this kind of cut and paste in the type uh, in the paper in the page that was uh, typewritten mm. i see yeah it required a lot of resilience uh, from all the parts involved in the process because it's very demanding mm. and uh, uh, have you considered working in the industry after completing your PhD? And when did you complete your PhD? I completed my PhD in 85, 1985. So I was 27 years old. No, I never considered going to the industry. This was not for me. I didn't, I was not attracted. 
Mm -hmm. I uh, maybe because I had this experience in an insurance company, but also I wanted to be independent, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the idea of independence. I don't like to have a boss. Mm. I like to, to do what I li like to work on the problem I find relevant and interesting and, and with people I like. So I was very much attracted by academia and uh, so industry yeah. was not. I can totally relate this intellectual freedom we have in academia. Uh, it's priceless, right? It's, it's very exactly. Important. That was exactly what I wanted to say. It's priceless. Yeah. For me, it's it made my life. Yes, <laughs> yes, I understand perfectly. Uh, you got a couple of job offers, uh, but uh, outside Belgium, right? After finishing your PhD. Yes. When, when I finished my PhD, I, I stayed about nine months, I think, more in, in Brussels, uh, time to find, to decide where to go, what to do, and and finish the papers coming from my PhD. And at that time, so I went to a job interview at uh, the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in, uh, in New York State, in Troy. And uh, so I went there for a job interview of two or three days and came back and happened. yes, I, I liked it. It was very interesting and uh, I was thinking that this would be a good uh, solution for me, uh, given that I was attracted by academia. Um, they told me they would send me an offer. Indeed, uh, a couple of weeks later, I got through the mail uh, the, the offer. But at the same time, I got an offer from uh, the University of Strasbourg uh, in, uh, in France. And um, there was a, a possibility to have a visiting uh, professor position there for one year, which would eventually become uh, a permanent position as professor there. And so I had those two on my desk and it was a very hard decision for me uh, to, to decide what to do. And at the end I thought, okay, um, maybe if I go to, to Strasbourg, it's easier if I want to come back to Belgium. Uh, if I go to the, to the US, then I think it's another life that will start for me. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to go to Strasbourg mm. and I stayed there one and a half year. Mm -hmm. Were you married at that time? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I, I had a boyfriend, uh, uh -huh. and he was indeed in Brussels, so Strasbourg was uh, easier somehow. I could come back for the weekend. Uh, it, it was not that far away. Uh, so. Is this boyfriend the reason you know uh, to speak Portuguese? Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> yeah. This is how I. Uh, I learned Portuguese. I had a Portuguese boyfriend for several years. Ah, mm -hmm. that's very nice. It's, uh, it's a, I think, the best way to learn a language. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely had an emotional connection and that, and a good motivation in that in that case, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, eventually, went to the Netherlands. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, after Strasbourg. Um, I got a position at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam at uh, the Econometric Institute, uh, where I stayed uh, four years. Mm. And how was it? Uh, did you learn Dutch? And did that yes. in new, oh. new environment uh, make make you uh, you know a better researcher? And how? yeah. Uh, I have a nice anecdote. I think you will like it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went to Rotterdam and first um, the, the university sent me to um, uh, to a school to learn Dutch because uh, I had to teach in Dutch. Mm -hmm. And maybe you know that in Belgium we speak, well, there are actually two main languages, uh, which are French and Flemish. Yes. Flemish is, is nothing else than Dutch. Mm -hmm. So I had a uh, Dutch class at school, at high school for many years, but I was uh, very bad at learning languages. And I must say that in Belgium, the pressure for learning the other language is, is not strong, unfortunately. So my, my Dutch was very basic. 
So the university sent me to, to this school and I spent there two weeks. I remember it, uh, I, I was staying in the, in the family. Uh, it was in the Netherlands and uh, close to, to this school. And every day I was uh, at that, that school uh, where I was having private lessons. And then I had to, um, to do some exercise. And this was a, a school where many people were coming for uh, learning languages. They had uh, some princess. I think they had the Queen of Belgium as as uh, wow. Uh, student. Yeah, they had military people, uh, diplomats, and and university professor like me. I mean, uh, the university sent me there. Uh, extremely uh, fantastic school. And for lunch, we had uh, uh, we were eating all together. In, there was a big uh, room, and th these were round table for about eight to ten people. And one day, I was sitting next to to uh, a man, and um, so he started to talk to me. We started to discuss in English. He was Dutch, and uh, he asked me why I was there, what I was doing. So I told him, well, uh, I got a position at the university in Rotterdam, and um, so I'm here to learn Dutch to teach. And this guy looked at me and said, but you should be at home and raise kids. This is not a job for a woman. Really? Yes. I was muted. Ah. <laughs> That's shock shocking, actually. <laughs> Very shocking. Ah. Extremely shocking. I was high. Uh, I mean, I thought this, you know, it was confronting like your independence and, you know, yes, all, yeah. yes this is, uh, because uh, I, I remember during the, the, the pre interview, we had, you asked me whether the, the, I had any uh, gender issue in uh -huh. my life or things like that. And this time I was really, I think one or twice in my life I had funny, funny stories like that, but this was really for me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> that was in, in early nineties. Mm -hmm. And so, but besides of that in Rotterdam, it was very nice for me because, uh, it was a very strong OI environment. Uh, I had uh, several colleagues. I started to collaborate with, uh, I enjoyed very much my stay there. Well, wow, that's excellent. Uh, so you you were saying that you learned Dutch, Portuguese, English eventually, of course, you French native tongue. Uh, and then you know also Spanish, too, because yes. you have a, some special connection with Spain. Yes, I have a s special connection with Spain. Actually, I have a house there. And now that I'm retired, I share my time between Belgium and Spain. Uh -huh. And uh, I have many friends also in Spanish universities. I have very strong connection with, with Spain. This is my second home country, if I can say. Uh -huh. uh, and I like very much the culture, the people, the food, the weather, the nature, the everything. So, yeah. Yeah. So I speak Spanish. <laughs> yeah, I've been twice to Spain and, and I, I love it. It's, it's very nice. I, I can confirm everything you said. <laughs> So uh, but after the, these four years you were uh, in Rotterdam, you had the opportunity to return to Brussels. Yes. Um, they were, uh, it was not easy in those years. That was the, the early 90s. It was not easy to, um, to, have academic, uh, to have an academic position in Belgium. There were very, very few. Belgium is already a tiny country. Mm -hmm. um, but there was one possibility, in fact, the, the National Science Foundation, the Belgian one, um, is, uh, was and is still uh, funding permanent research position that exists in France also, for instance, the, the CNRS. Mm -hmm. And um, so th this was a possibility. It, it's a competition. And so I went back to see my uh, PhD uh, supervisor. And I talked to her, I told her that I was interested to, to come back to, to Belgium and ask her whether she thought that I had a chance in, in this competition. And uh, so she encouraged me, I tried and uh, I got it. So uh, I came back to Belgium in this way. I became a full-time research uh, uh, for a few years. And then I my position, well, 
uh, was turned back turned into an academic one mm. uh, because there, there's a limited number of such positions per university so it's important for them to to have always this pool of position to to have people they want to to attract mm -hmm. uh, can we say that you were the person that really put or forward uh, in Brussels uh, I guess so, yes. Um, as I said, there was a group in uh, multi-criteria decision-making, decision but um, I'm, I'm, I would say the person who put the, the, the optimization side mm, okay. of, of war forward, yes. Mm -hmm. you, should, you should be very proud of that. <laughs> well, yeah, it's nice. Uh, it, it was a very nice time. I had a great time uh, building a team there and... Uh, and then uh, there's a, an, another professor there who is Bernard Fortz, uh, mm. who, is, uh, now, uh, who was my colleague for many years. Uh, he was your PhD student, had, uh, right? Yes, he was my PhD student. Mm -hmm. um, he came back, he, he got his PhD, he did his PhD with me, and then he went back, he went, sorry, to Maastricht uh, mm. for a postdoc and then to... Uh, uh, Louvain La Neuve, mm -hmm. uh, also, and then after a few years, uh, he applied. There was an open position, and uh, came back to. Okay. To but we 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 are very good friends, and uh, it was also a, a pleasure to build up this this group together. And uh, now he's uh, he's the one leading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your contributions to the fields of network design and location problems. Uh, which ones do you think are worth highlighting among the numerous contributions you, ha you have in, the, in this uh, field? Ah, that's difficult. In uh, regarding location and, and network design, I would say one of the result, one of the, the thing I like very much was the the. Uh, um, the different formulation uh, I used uh, for solving p center and p median problems uh, that allowed to solve uh, instances that were larger than than all to, so for solving them up to optimality. Mm -hmm. So I think this is uh, this is uh, this is what we call them telescopic formulation. <laughs> Why? It's based on it's based on the radius that is covered by a facility, ah. and um, and it proved to be extremely efficient. So I, I like very much these these papers that we did on those those problems. Uh huh. Right. So uh, the fact that you could uh, solve larger larger problems to optimality. Uh, uh, for this very famous class of problems, P center and P medium, you think uh, one of the of your greatest achievements in research regarding this type of problems, right? I would say yes, and also I did some uh, some interesting uh, uh, contribution regarding hub location problems mm -hmm. at the very beginning, and uh, in telecommunication also quite a lot of. Uh, application of hub location in telecommunication. Also, uh, Hande Yaman uh, was one of my PhD students, worked with me on those problems, and uh, that was, uh, I think, very interesting, very nice. Uh -huh. And what about bi-level optimization problems? Uh, before describing your main contributions, could you quickly explain how they work, as some listeners might not be uh, familiar with them? <laughs> yes. Uh, my level optimization is, is trendy nowadays, I'm very pleased about that. Um, so what it is about? Well, we all know what is an optimization problem. You want to maximize or minimize, let's say, an objective uh, function under some constraints. And the specificity of a bi-level optimization problem is that a subset of variables must be the optimal solution of an, another optimization problem. So you have a nesting of two optimization problems. And this is what makes difficult the, the problem difficult, more difficult than the regular single level optimization problem. 
You see, there's a group of constraints which says, well, those variables are the optimal solution of another optimization problem. Mm -hmm. And so th this, pro this, uh, this concept, this framework has a lot of application, uh, in, uh, among others, in, for pricing problem. You want simply to determine the optimal price of products you want to put on the market in order to maximize your revenue. And uh, there are uh, customers who are potentially interested in buying your product, but they may also be interested in buying product of a competitor. So if you put your, the, the price of your product too high, uh, you lose customer. But if you make it too low, uh, also you lose some revenue because maybe you could have increased your price. So what is the right price for you to maximize your revenue? Mm. And uh, you see the second level is the fact that the, the customer they optimize their own objective function. That is, they, they want to minimize the, the, the cost they will pay for what they want to, to get. Right. Uh, so I've been working quite a lot on these, and, and I think uh, for instance, the, 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 the major contribution maybe uh, on this problem is maybe the first, one of the first paper I published on that, that was with uh, my two very good friends, Patrice Marcotte and, and Gilles Savard. And that was a paper that was published in the 90s in Management Science, wow. in which we consider the, the problem of uh, toll optimization for a highway. Ah. And uh, so we, we, we provide several interesting results about uh, the complexity of the problem, some re single level reformulation. The goal in bi-level optimization is, uh, I would say, almost always uh, first to, you want to reformulate the problem as a single level optimization problem, mm -hmm. because these are things that we know better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if the second level is a good uh, problem, for instance, if it's uh, a convex optimization problem, you can use the KKT optimality mm. conditions uh, to do so. And then you obtain the single level optimization problem, but but it is uh, usually I would say a dirty one. You have uh, a lot of nonlinearities coming from uh, uh, products of variables and and so on, mm. and so then you start working on it. Yeah, and you have to linearize. Uh, then the formulation yes. becomes heavy, and you have to find ways to uh, exactly. solve them. And yeah, right. Uh, in your opinion. What do you consider promising avenues of research concerning location and network design problems as well as bi-level optimization problems? Okay. Um, stochastic versions of them, I think, are extremely challenging and interesting. Uh, especially for location and network design problem. Um, they are, we are doing nowadays progress, more and more progress regarding uh, stochastic uh, version of problems be using Bender's decomposition approach or similar thing. And, uh, and, and for location, it is very important for location network design problem, uh, especially to, to guarantee the, that the, the system is still operational in case of uh, disruption. Mm. Uh, and so you can have, uh, you can associate probabilities to different scenario of this uh, disruption. Mm -hmm. I think these are important and uh, interesting uh, uh, network design and location problem. They have also an important application in uh, in telecommunication, in communication, mm -hmm. uh, transportation, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, for by level optimization problem, um, it's so wide open, I think. Uh, already, I, I always like to look at the, 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 the by level uh, linear, linear problems in when both level are are linear. I think this 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 problem are still not well solved. There are still many things to want to be understood, and uh, the introduction of uh, of uh, stochasticity is important as well. I think. Right. Uh, you have a vast editorial activity. Uh, 
Recently, we, you even acted as the editor-in-chief of the Euro Journal on Computational Optimization. I know, for example, that there might be a pressure to increase the impact factor of journals and so on. Uh, what is your impression on this topic and how did you handle this? Mm. That's, uh, that's an important topic indeed. We already discussed this. And um, the, I would say the impact factor is a disease. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> very, very rough, but in the sense that it does not, the, the, the impact factor system has been invented by, you know, by medical doctors, I think, if mm. I'm not mistaken, uh, at least in the field of biology or medicine, chemistry and so on. So that's why you think it's a disease? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't think about it, but... <laughs> no. uh, it, I think it does not reflect the, the real quality of the journal. This is my problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and this, this uh, impact factor, this concept, this, this, uh, yeah, this concept is, is used to evaluate people and uh, department and uh, research funding application for many evaluations. Uh, and there are countries, uh, Spain is one of them, uh, where the rule is that you have to publish in the top 10 or top 20 journal with respect to the impact factor in your discipline. And, and this, this, is, this is not a good way to evaluate people because the, the, sometimes the, the work you are doing does not fit to, to, to the, the type of the journals in the top 10. For instance, if you are doing some very fundamental uh, mathematical programming uh, uh, research, um, there are not so many journals in the, in the top 10 that, that would, where you, what you do could fit. And, and so the people have, are, are biased well, they are forced to, mm -hmm. to, to be biased by this and to always try to, to publish in those journals, and this is not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, this is why I say this is a disease. I think this is very bad. Of course, it's an indication. I understand that this is, can be used, but, but not as a general rule that should be applied uh, without any... Uh, variation right yeah i have experienced something similar with some co-authors they they claim no uh, only this subset of journals work for us it, it otherwise it won't count so uh, yeah. uh, it can be very frustrating right if for the other authors right they want to go yeah. to some journal but they they're kind of blocked because one of the authors are in a difficult position or in a situation that they have to pick the specific ones from the, the, the list. Yeah, but it's bad sometimes for them. I was discussing this issue recently with uh, some quarters who wanted to decide where to submit the paper. And I don't care anymore. I mean, uh, I'm retired. I, I publish paper for fun and mainly for the people I'm working with. Mm -hmm. This has no importance for me. But the, the journal uh, where the, the paper would fit was not not the right ones and and in some sometimes in this way the researcher does not do does not have a good strategy with respect to his or her own career yes in the long term so, it might be exactly. damaged a little bit because you you refuse to publish in some journals that are maybe lower mm -hmm. in the impact factor list but that are much more, much better regarded by our community. Mm -hmm. This is the the problem. It, I mean, the correlation is is not not complete and not one equal to one. Yeah, yeah. you say. have the qualitative aspect, mm -hmm. uh, right? Yes. Yeah, the prestige. And this is, this mm -hmm. is the, the the problem mm -hmm. for me. Right. Do you have any other interesting memories from these editorial experiences? It's a very interesting activity. Um, 
that is not always easy to to handle because uh, when you are editor in chief and you get two referee reports, uh, one positive, one negative, or two positive and one negative, and then an associate editor who tells you uh, reject. Um, it is very difficult. The the refereeing process is a is a difficult uh, thing. Um, people are too much solicited for mm -hmm. this. We receive every day, uh, not maybe not every day request, but so many requests that too many. Yes. Um, and and then you start to. Either you don't do the work properly. Uh, this is, I think, the, the, the real problem. When if a referee doesn't do his uh, or her work uh, in in a good way, uh, you you get a, a referee report that is useless for for the authors. This is not a good thing. On the other hand, uh, I would like also to to stress the fact that. There are also papers that are submitted by authors, and I don't know what they expect. They expect that the referee is going to do their job. Uh, they don't do really a, a great effort to to have a paper that is polished, that is well written, and uh, before, when it is submitted. Mm -hmm. And there may be a lack of respect from both sides. Uh, beside of that, there are fantastic referees, fantastic papers submitted by authors that you feel this is really what I want to have. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right. But it's a very difficult system. Huh? We need this evaluation in one way or another. We still don't know how to go out of this this system. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Well, Martin, you were the first woman to be president of Euro and also uh, the first woman to receive their gold medal. How was yes. the experience, uh, you know, while you were president? Well, the, the president experience was very nice. Uh, it was a two years, uh, very uh, interesting uh, job. Uh, the meetings of the the board, the Euro board, were fantastic, uh, very friendly. We enjoy, I enjoyed it very much. It was. Uh, I think Euro has very interesting and and efficient instruments. I always talk about the the, the Euro Summer Institute and Winter Institute that are organized by Euro. Uh, I must say also that I was I participated in the very first one. That was in 1984, I think. Uh, it was a, a summer institute on location mm -hmm. uh, theory. Uh, and I still keep contact with some of the people who participated with me to, to this, uh, this mm -hmm. institute. Uh, so it allows the young people to, uh, to create networks, very efficient to, to meet senior uh, people in their discipline and to have uh, exchange. Uh, so this this Euro time uh, as president was I like it very much and I, I try also to uh, to maybe better organize the the different uh, selection procedure for the for the prizes. I think that this was an important thing also to keep the memory uh, inside the society about the how how the the. the the committee functions uh, and uh, what are the criteria and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you are also vice president of iForce and vice president of international affairs of Informs. Uh, were you able to have a better picture of the several OR communities spread across the globe? Yeah, it's true that I was. Uh, I served on the Informs board, on, on, on the uh, IFORS, and also on some SIAM activity group and, and Euro. So I, I've seen quite a lot around the world. And um, it's true that it's different. Uh, for instance, Informs and Euro are very different type of 
society, if I can say. Also, Euro is a, a society of national societies. Mm -hmm. The members of Euro are the national society. In forms is different. The members are, are people. Mm. Uh, so, and also, the, they have the same role, but they, they have different uh, way of functioning. And uh, I think it was very interesting to see uh, all of them. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say one is better than the other. They are different. Right. You also had the chance to see it in how it works in Asia and uh, Latin America. Yes, to I force indeed, and also to see Latin America. Alio, representative of Alio, has always been a great pleasure for me to go to uh, to South America, Latin America. Uh -huh. I like it a lot. Uh, I actually I go every year to Chile. Uh, I've been to Brazil. Uh, to Cuba, to Mexico, uh, I like it very much. Yeah. According to your CV, you have attended more than 200 conferences in your lifetime. <laughs> As yeah. we're talking about traveling, uh, do, do you have any stories to share? Uh, maybe the, my first meeting, my first international meeting was a location meeting uh, called Isold. Mm, it's famous, I yeah. Think it was in 1985 or 84. Uh, it was happening in in um, in Boston and in Martha's Vineyard. Uh -huh. And the first part of so it was on two different locations. The first part was on, on an island on, called Thompson Island that is in the harbor of Boston. And so I arrived there. That was my first meeting abroad, uh, important one. Uh, first, I, I arrived no suitcase <laughs> at the airport. <laughs> we all been through start. that. Yeah, I know. Yes. <laughs> when it's your first meeting, it's quite interesting. Yeah. So I followed instruction from there. I had to go to, to the harbor of Boston and there to, to get a, a boat. And uh, so I arrived there in, on, on this island, registered for the conference. And the first thing the people at the the registration looked at me and said, "Oh, this is you, Martin Labbé." Mm. And in fact, they were embarrassed because they thought I was a man. So <laughs> <laughs> they had matched me with a man in the room. In the room. Ah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sin Ho told a similar story too uh, in, yeah. in one particular event. Yeah. And so, okay, well, finally they rearranged their plan and they, uh, I got a room. And um, so this, this Thompson Island apparently was uh, an island in which there was a, a college for difficult boys, if I want to understand, okay. uh, that needed some education. Special care. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so it was only for men. So there was one type of bathroom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Many things were like that. It was quite funny because at this conference, maybe we were, I don't know, maybe 10 women and there were 60 or 70 men. Uh -huh. And uh, so they had to arrange everything so that we could have a, a, a time for, for taking our shower in the morning. <laughs> It was quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're talking about uh, the, this proportion. Uh, you were a role model for many people, especially the girls. Uh, and mm. I've just started teaching face to face, and it, uh, and it broke my heart uh, uh, a bit to literally see that only 10% of my class are composed of female students. Um, as a scholar that accomplished so much in academia and as a person that occupied several important leadership positions, what do you have to say about this unfavorable situation regarding women in STEM? Well, I have two messages, I would say. Uh, first, to the, to, the, to the women. I think everything is possible you have to follow your path your passion you have to do what you want to do and you will succeed and uh, research is a brilliant choice <laughs> from my point of view it's fantastic i can only encourage you to pursue it and 
you must dare to do it. There is no reason to for fear. It's not because you are uh, a woman that you are not able as much as a man to do research or this type of activity. We are uh, all the same and it's go ahead and do it. So this is my message. But now uh, also I have another message. I think it's uh, very important uh, to tell the families, the parents, that they have to be open and push the girls to go in the STEM discipline to study this kind of uh, thing. Um, there are brilliant jobs, fantastic, super attractive. And uh, I remember in the old days, you know, the buzzword for a girl was one was telling her, well, you would be could be a teacher that's good for for raising a family that's a good career and then a boy what would you say to a boy oh you should study engineering or medicine or law this is good for boys come on this is revolting mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nonsense yeah yes nonsense i think we, we the family the parents must really push their daughters to to do this kind of career it is has a bright future and this is totally appropriate to have a family mm -hmm. there is no reason for making a difference between men and women yeah they tend to be a bit uh conservative i mean they they, they yeah, at least here they they think about medicine law and dentistry uh, but even with, you know, uh, computer science and uh, applied math, statistics, you know, yeah. they're all really uh, in, the, in the mainstream nowadays. And you have plenty of jobs, plenty of opportunities, but still uh, the families, they hold the, their own kids back and they don't know you should do this and that because it's the safer choice. Uh, that bothers me quite a lot, in fact. Yeah. I fully agree with you. That bothers me too. When when I hear somebody making such uh, such comment, you see, I'm boiling. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've received uh, uh, some comments by my students. A uh, couple of them. Uh, one of them uh, even mentioned that uh, the the relatives from their father's side they were really discouraging her towards uh, engineering and science because it's it's not for girls or they won't make money so it's completely uh, absurd <laughs> why what uh, i mean there's no well sorry <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um uh, you got married at some point you had a kid you mentioned and how about handling maternity and work how was it in your case oh that's another funny story uh when my, I had my son, um, well, when I was expecting my son, I started to, um, to look for information regarding my replacement when I would be on matern maternity leave. And so I contacted the administration at the university and I learned at that time that, of course, I had uh, in Belgium the right, I think it's if I'm right, it's 10 weeks. I don't remember the number of weeks, but you have a, a leave fully paid uh, for maternity. But the university had no funds, nothing to pay somebody to replace me. Because I don't know, it was not in the, it was not conceivable that maybe <laughs> A professor could have a child. It was not uh, in 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 the organization of the the system. It was not so. So uh, that means that the department did not get uh, funding to to pay somebody to teach when I was on on, on leave. Wow. <laughs> so how did they solve the problem? I don't remember. Finally, the solution was found, but. It, I, it, at that time, it, my, my son was born in 1996, yes, uh -huh. and so 
at that time it was not it was not in in the books i mean this 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 problem was not a problem it was not supposed to happen uh-huh. i think now this is this is over yeah no but it's <laughs> it's quite strange and yes. and for you was to how did you juggle with your son and work oh my husband has been was abs- uh, has been and is still absolutely fantastic he has been the the best supporter I had. He helped me a lot uh, during all my career. Uh, this is uh, this is. I was in this fantastic situation because I, when my son was born, I was thirty-eight years old, so uh, I was not that young, mm-hmm. <laughs> if mm-hmm. I can say. I was a bit more. Uh, but my my husband was very supportive, and uh, he was always present and. Uh, he, he, thanks to him, I, I could uh, travel, continue to travel and attend conference, visit universities, uh, and so on. Yeah, that's very good to hear. Um, yes. I hope it motivates yeah. our other husbands uh, to, do, to do the same. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it seems that your son is also an OR person. Uh, how did that happen? Yes. And did you have the chance to collaborate with him? Yes. <laughs> Uh, indeed. So my my son is uh, is uh, in his last year of PhD uh, in optimization at the University of Trier in Germany, and um, this year we have been uh, collaborating. In fact, we participated uh, together with his uh, his PhD advisor and two other colleagues from Lille. Uh, we participated to the um, the Roadef Euro Challenge. Mm. All together, mm-hmm. uh, it was great fun. I must say, uh, it's one of my youth in my life. It's uh, to have uh, this collaboration with my son. And uh, the cherry on the cake is that we we won the the prize for uh, the scientific prize for the challenge. Wow! So for the best paper. So Excellent. I'm extremely proud. Uh, it's. Uh, yeah. Do you are you more strict with him uh, compared to the, your regular students? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, you should ask him. Actually, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. But uh-huh. I have the impression that we go along very well. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's no that's, fight. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you retired just before the pandemic, uh, but you still remain uh, very active research-wise. How is life now, and what are your plans for the future? Hmm, life is great. Uh, I'm so thankful for having decided to retire to early, retire earlier. Actually, I retired at 61 years old, uh, just before the pandemic, because uh, this allowed me uh, not to teach online with all those problems, all those issues. Mm-hmm. I had nothing to do with that, so I'm very super happy. Mm-hmm. And since then, actually, I, I decided to retire because I did not want to uh, to teach anymore. I was a bit tired of teaching, and uh, also I was uh, tired of uh, administration. I I I, in, I was involved quite uh, significantly into administration, and I wanted to get rid of all those things and. And given that research is uh, something I love very, very much, I thought, okay, uh, I retire and I keep on doing research. And that's what I do since. Mm -hmm. Um, It has been the last two years very much on Zoom, Mm -hmm. of course, Mm -hmm. meeting people on Zoom. But I'm still uh, doing uh, very active in research, working with people uh, from uh, different parts in the world. It's great fun. And, and I keep the best of, of our profession, I think. Working with people I like on problems that are challenging and nice and motivating, it's great fun. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's very nice to hear too. Uh, I'm really glad that you are happy and expressing that. And that is also motivating for other people that are, are thinking of following uh, a similar path, right? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, it's good for the brain also. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Of the brain. <laughs> yeah. Well, Martin. Keeps you fresh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Well, Martin, it was a pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, I was super happy with this conversation. I had a wonderful time. So, merci Muito beaucoup. Muito obrigado. Ah, de nada. Ah. Foi um, um grande prazer uh-huh. falar contigo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wish I could answer that in French at least, but uh, je ne parle pas français, so... <laughs> ah, fantastic, very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it was wonderful. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, I hope to meet you in person soon, and you're always, of course, welcome to, to visit us in João Pessoa in Brazil. And congratulations for for your your interview work. It is fantastic. I love it. I think it's a great idea. Please keep on. Uh, it's really uh, excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for these super encouraging words. It means a lot to me. So uh, hope to see you soon, Martin. Ciao. Okay. Hope to Bye. see you soon. Thank you, Anand. Bye. Bye. Ciao.